There have been many processes discussed over the years that seek to assist many individuals with dealing with criminal matters. Many bright and gifted researchers have contributed to the storehouse of information and have helped to shed light on the true nature of the American judicial system. A quick Google search of the internet will reveal a cornucopia of websites and videos dedicated to the subject of discharging debt, eliminating traffic tickets, or criminal charges. I've researched many of these remedies over the years and have come to the conclusion that our judicial system is commercial in nature. In other words, our prison system today is nothing more than debtor prisons where individuals are incarcerated to pay their debt to society and held as surety for the repayment of a debt. This system of debtors' prisons can be traced back to as early as 1300 with Edward I and the Statute Merchant. Statute Merchant One of two 13th century statutes establishing procedures to better secure and recover debts by, among other things, providing for a commercial bond that, if not timely paid, resulted in swift execution of the lands, goods, and body of the debtor. These statutes were repealed in 1863, also termed pocket judgment. Since too, the commercial bond so established. It is not a little remarkable that our common law knew no process whereby a man could pledge his body or liberty for payment of a debt. Under Edward I, the tide turned. In the interest of commerce, a new form of security, the so-called statute merchant, was invented which gave the creditor power to demand the seizure and imprisonment of his debtor's body. Frederick Pollock and Frederick W. Maitland, The History of English Law Before the Time of Edward I, pages 596 through 597, second edition, 1899. Today, we are still living under the statute merchant. However, this is being kept secret from you because criminal charges are in actuality a debt collection. House Joint Resolution 192 is the public declaration that no one can demand debt be paid in any particular form of currency. The only thing we have left in circulation as a medium of exchange is debt currency. The secret that the powers that be do not want exposed to the general public is that they can actually tender a bond, evidence of a debt, to discharge their criminal cases as long as they have not hurt anyone or their property. This video is dedicated to showing you one possible way of doing this. Bond, a certificate or evidence of a debt on which the issuing company or governmental body promises to pay the bond holders a specified amount of interest for a specified length of time and to repay the loan on the expiration date a long-term debt instrument that promises to pay the lender a series of periodic interest payments in addition to returning the principal at maturity. In every case, a bond represents debt. Its holder is a creditor of the corporation and not a part owner as is the shareholder. The word bond is sometimes used more broadly to refer also to unsecured debt instruments. Definitions used here are generally from Black's Law, 6th edition. Number one, bond supporting credit authorizations. This bond is the debt side of the implied contract that resulted when your grandparents took all of their gold to the Federal Reserve Bank by May 1st, 1933. A bond is always evidence of a debt. It can be a liability to the debtor or an asset to the creditor. This bond is also the implied debt that resulted when you applied for a birth certificate for new entities, straw men, you requested that the states create when you had your babies. You put a description of your baby on the application. This tied the baby and the new straw man together as long as the described baby man lived. When the man dies, the straw man is terminated by the state with a death certificate. It has no commercial energy without the man. Straw man, a front, a third party who is put up in name only to take part in a transaction nominal party to a transaction. One, all caps John, who acts as an agent for another, real living soul John, for the purpose of taking title to real property and executing whatever documents and instruments the principal, real living soul John, may direct respecting the property. Person, all caps John, who purchases property for another, real living soul John, 
to conceal identity or real purchaser, or to accomplish some purpose otherwise not allowed. Can mix public and private. Implied partnership, one which is not a real partnership, but which is recognized by the court as such because of the conduct of the parties. The defendant trust and you as trustee as the defendant surety. In effect, the parties are a stop from denying the existence of a partnership. That is a dishonor. This bond is also the implied debt that resulted when you applied for a title to a car, a mortgage, or any other loan that resulted in collateral being registered with the state. You cannot be required to pledge your substance, but you can voluntarily pledge it to help the U.S. through its bankruptcy status. Pledge, a bailment. Bailment, a delivery of goods or personal property by one person, bailor, straw man, to another, bailey, state or U.S., in trust for the execution of a special object, exemption, upon or in relation to such goods. If you do not volunteer, you may be given choices to make it easier for you to volunteer, but you must always do this voluntarily. You're not asked to give your substance, only to pledge it, while you keep possession of the substance. In return, you get the implied bond. The straw man received a social security number. The correlating private side number is the exemption identification number, same digits, just no dashes. The straw man is a creation of the debtor corporation, so it is presumed to be an officer, agent, or employee of the debtor corporation. It must file tax returns and follow all the corporate rules and regulations, public laws. The man, on the other hand, is not a creation of the debtor corporation, but is the presumed representative of the straw man. The man is also the one who has the creditor side of the debt the U.S. owes. This is the national debt at least part of it. Part of the national debt is owed to the people who pledge their substance in return for an exemption from paying public debts. The U.S. runs on credit. It does not have its own credit. Everything is backed by the full faith and credit of the people. We have to have faith the U.S. will honor its debts, and we have to know how to use our credit. The straw man cannot use your credit on its own, but it can use it if you authorize it, our authorization is backed by the implied contract and the resulting bond, debt, the U.S. has to the people. As long as the people are not acting like debtors and victims, they can use their credit. When the people start acting like debtors, straw men, they dishonor their own heritage and rights. Your private instruments are backed by this bond. The number on the bond is your social security number without dashes for the real living soul, John Doe. Number two, bond for discharge. This is the creditor slash holder side of the bond, evidence of a debt. When you use a bond for discharge, you are using your credit backed by the implied bond, debt, resulting from your pledge to help the U.S. through its bankruptcy. There is no value limit to this bond as you voluntarily agree to pledge every bit of substance you ever get until the money is put back into circulation. All the substance you have, cars, dirt, shoes, food, toothbrushes, was acquired by giving the merchants Federal Reserve notes. You can never get title to things unless you pay for them. Since there is no money in the U.S., only debt paper, every time you get a pair of shoes, you're exchanging a debt for the shoes. In the U.S. since 1933, that is an acceptable practice. Outside the U.S. and its states, in the states, that is not acceptable. If you tried to get shoes without paying for them in the States, you would be put in jail for stealing. But in the jurisdiction of the United States, you can get possession of the shoes by giving the merchant debt paper. You just can't get title. If you want the title, you will have to give the merchant a real asset from the private side, substance. The only substance that is yours is your exemption. That equates to credit in admiralty and equity. March 9, 1933, 73rd Congress. Mr. Patman, under the new law, the money is issued to the banks in return for government obligations, bills of exchange, drafts, notes, trade acceptances, and bankers' acceptances. The money will be worth 100 cents on the dollar because it is backed by the credit of the nation. It will represent a mortgage on all the homes and other property of all the people in the nation. 
The money so issued will not have one penny of gold coverage behind it because it is really not needed. I think the banking system is, uh, is riding for a fall. I think they're, they're becoming government bond brokers and commercial bookkeepers. They're being, they're keeping their portfolios filled with government guaranteed paper and government bonds. And I was always told as a kid, when we used to hunt coons and, and uh, rabbits and go a fox hunting now and then, we never did feed our dogs before we started hunting. And that's the way the banks are. They're all fed up with government bonds and guaranteed paper, and they, they're more or less indifferent toward the little man who needs local loans. I see. We've got to make some changes. You think there. they should go back into banking then, do you, Congressman? Well, we've got to do something about that, I think. Yes. Well, thank you very much yes. for being with us tonight, sir. These bills of exchange are government obligations to the public corporations and to the private investors. These bankers' acceptances are government obligations. When you accept a presentment for value and return it, you have just done a banker's acceptance. Public banks can also do a banker's acceptance. It is not limited to just one side or the other. Have you asked who is issuing the new money to the banks? Can the government issue money to the banks? Can other banks issue money to the banks? Where is this new money that is going to be issued to the banks? Where does the bank go when it wants to be issued more money? The people have always been the private bankers in the states in America. Now we also have public bankers. The people used to dig the gold and silver out of the ground, have it minted, and then put into circulation. Now the people sign notes, give them to the banks to turn into dead money, and the banks put the debt into circulation as money. It would be against the law for the people to do that. They have to issue their credit money to the bank to do this through the straw man. When you use the U.S. bond, even though it is an implied bond, to discharge a public debt, the debt is discharged. House Joint Resolution 192 is the written public insurance policy guaranteeing this can be done. The people are still issuing new money to the banks by signing notes and giving them to the banks. Implied. This word is used in law in contrast to express. In other words, where the intention in regard to the subject matter is not manifested by explicit and direct words, but is gathered by implication or necessary deduction from the circumstances, the general language, or the conduct of the parties. Implied promise. Fiction, which the law creates to render one liable on contract theory so as to avoid fraud or unjust enrichment. Using the bond, debt, to discharge another debt is common in the U.S. Mr. Patman said the new money represented a mortgage on all the homes and other property of all the people in the nation. He used the word nation with an expansive intent. There were and are no people in the nation. The nation is a political fiction. But there are people behind all the straw men which are in the nation. On a mortgage, there is always a debtor and a creditor. The new money was issued based on the people and U.S. corporations turning in their gold. The corporations were controlled by the U.S., but the people were not. The corporations had no choice, but the people did. The people volunteered to enter an implied contract with the U.S. The new deal was announced in Congress in March 1933. The executive order was given in April. The gold had to be turned in the Federal Reserve Banks by May 1st. The Congress proclaimed its public policy and House Joint Resolution 192 in June. The new public policy was that no creditor on this new mortgage could require payment in any particular form of U.S. coin or currency. As creditors, the people could not require payment on the new mortgage in gold. Neither could any other creditor. That new deal made the people who participated in the salvation of the U.S. corporations creditors. It also made debtors of the U.S. corporations and their officers, agents, and employees, including all the straw men. This is an example of set off and adjustment of mutual debts. The straw man owes debt to a U.S. corporation or agency, and the U.S. owes a debt to an implied promise to the man. The U.S. can never pay the man because there is no money. But the U.S. can give the straw man debt money it can use in commerce in the U.S. to get possession of products and services for you. You get to use the products or services. 
When you use the bond to discharge a public debt, you've used your exemption, credit, which is the only title you can have on the private side. You are an investor in the U.S. corporations. That does not make you an owner, it makes you a creditor. Number three, appearance bond. This is a bond that assures you will appear in a court proceeding. It is not a catch-all bond that covers everything that will come up in the case. To get the appearance bond, you have to give your word, bond, that you will appear to finish settling the accounting. It is issued by the hearing officer. If it is requested and if there is no controversy, if you are honorable enough not to start arguing with the hearing officer or the complainant or the prosecuting attorney, you can get this bond. There must be no controversy. That fact is established by your voluntary act of accepting the charging instrument for value and returning it. In doing so, you are exchanging your exemption credit for the discharge of the charges. You are bonding your pledge to appear and settle. If it were not voluntary, that would be bondage. You must tell the hearing officer that you are not disputing any of the facts. Dispute, a conflict or controversy. An assertion of a right, claim, or demand on one side met by contrary claims or allegations on the other. The subject of litigation, the matter for which a suit is brought and upon which issue is joined, and in relation to which jurors are called and witnesses examined. When you enter a dispute, you join the issue and confirm the existence of what was just an idea, making it materialize and give subject matter that can be tested by a jury or witnesses. Once you ask for the bond, it is yours. If you ask for it again, it will appear that you do not know you already have it, and the hearing officer will proceed as though he is talking to a debtor straw man. A debtor straw man doesn't automatically get an appearance bond. It may be required to pay for a bail bond. An appearance bond with conditions incorporates a cost to you. If you have requested the appearance bond at no cost to you, there will be no conditions to the release. If you do not ask for it that way, there may be conditions, like drug testing, required meetings with court officers, or required daily or weekly phone calls. Those are at a cost to you, as they take your time and your property. If you don't appear and settle the accounting, you will be in dishonor of your word, your bond, and the appearance bond will be revoked. They will not tell you that it has been revoked. Your dishonor will then be used to carry out the presumption that you are representing the straw man in a fiduciary capacity and that you are in breach of your fiduciary duty. That is not allowed in equity. Then the debt of the straw man will be put on you. If there's not enough property held in the name of the straw man to cover the dishonor, or if you as trustee refuse to turn over the trust property to settle the debt, they will take your body as surety for the debt. It is the trustee's body being taken. You volunteer to be the trustee. Charging order. A statutorily created means for a creditor, plaintiff, of a judgment debtor, defendant, who is a partner of others, you, to reach the debtor's beneficial interest in the partnership, your credit, without risking dissolution of the partnership. Uniform Partnership Act, subsection 28. The purpose of the court case is for the judge to test the facts of an accounting. He is the auditor in a possible dispute between a creditor and a debtor. The creditor always wins. It is a matter of how much the debtor will pay that is being determined in a court case. Audit. Systematic inspection of accounting records involving analysis, test, and confirmations. The hearing and investigation had before an auditor. A formal or official examination and authentication of accounts with witnesses, vouchers, etc. Latin, audit, he hears, a hearing, from audio, to hear. Auditor, an officer of the court, assigned to state the items of debit and credit between the parties in a suit where accounts are in question, and exhibit the balance. Under rules of civil procedure, in many states, the term master is used to describe those persons formerly known as auditors. Magistrate, Latin, Magister, a master, from Magia, sorcery, from Greek Magia, the theology of magicians. Vouch, to give personal assurance or serve as a guarantee. Voucher, 
a receipt, acquittance, or release, which may serve as evidence of payment or discharge of a debt, or to certify the correctness of accounts. Number four, surety bond. The surety bond is used to subrogate liability from one party to another. It is similar to an indemnity bond. You can issue a surety bond to relieve someone who is in dishonor of potential financial damage. You can indemnify an honorable party who may have made a mistake by volunteering to be a surety. This is often the case with a judge. If you do this, you are moving into a creditor position because you are taking responsibility for the actions of another. Three parties are required. Number one, the one who is volunteering to be the surety. Number two, the debtor. And three, the creditor. There can be more than one creditor and more than one debtor. Creditor status can change during the case. When you become the creditor, someone has to be the debtor. If the prosecuting attorney signed the complaint and there is no bond in the case file and there's no signed security agreement, he is going to be the debtor. If he acts honorably and tells the judge he wants to settle or have the case dismissed, he stays in honor. You may have to authorize him to sign the check to settle the accounting. If he acts in dishonor, he is the one who will be left holding the bag. You can bond the parties and or bond the case. See Section 6, Case Bond. Suretyship. The relationship between three parties whereby one person, the surety, you, guarantees payment of a debtor's, defendant, debt owed to a creditor, plaintiff, or acts as a co-debtor, co-defendant. Generally speaking, the relation which exists where one person, you, has undertaken an obligation and another person, defendant, is also under an obligation or other duty to give energy slash credit to the obligee, plaintiff, who is entitled to but one performance, and as between the two who are bound, you and the defendant, one rather than the other should perform. Suretyship Bond a contractual arrangement created by your mother's signature on the application for the birth certificate between the surety, you, the principal, defendant, and the obligee, plaintiff, whereby the surety, you, agrees to protect the obligee, plaintiff, if the principal, defendant, defaults in performing the principal's contractual obligations, discharging debt, or in any way dishonors the plaintiff. The bond, your written word, is the instrument which binds the surety, you. The surety bond is delivered to the one who dishonored you. It is wise to have evidence of the dishonor before you issue a surety bond. Satisfactory evidence could be a certificate from a notary after an administrative process has been completed to assure there really is a dishonor. You might just think you were dishonored. If you are in dishonor yourself and have not corrected that mistake, you are not in a position to be claiming you have been dishonored. This is a very narrow window. You must always approach equity with clean hands. The surety bond is also delivered to the bonding company if the one in dishonor is a public officer with a bond. It is also delivered to the clerk of court if there is a court case in process. Always get a certified copy of the surety bond from the clerk after it is filed. Six, case bond. This bond is in the nature of a replevin bond. A replevin bond was formerly used in common law, equity, when there was a dispute and one party chose to file a claim in court against another party in possession of property in dispute. The moving party was required to bond his charge, claim, before he could get temporary possession of the subject property. The replevin bond was double the value of the subject property. Part of it was to indemnify the sheriff who seized the subject property from the defendant in possession. The other part was to guarantee the defendant would be reimbursed at least for the value of the seized property if it were not returned to him in the event he won the case. In equity, all charges need to be bonded. You have heard, put your money where your mouth is. That is what is happening when charges are brought in court and the moving party bonds the case. This policy assures that the defendant will not be damaged by an unsupported complaint. Charges are rarely bonded in modern court procedures until after the case is decided. By that time, the defendant is almost always in dishonor, so the prosecuting attorney can use the defendant's dishonor to bond the case. It is really the defendant's representative that is bonding the case. 
Again, it is the man's credit that gives life to the bond. If the defendant is in dishonor because of what its representative trustee said or did or did not say or did not do, it is the trustee's credit that is used to satisfy the debt, discharge the bond. You can voluntarily bond the case if there is no bond already in the clerk's file. Be sure to get a certified copy of the docket sheet as evidence there is no bond in the case before you issue your bond. When you bond the case, you are the creditor and the creditors win. If you bond the case, become the creditor, and then dishonor the judge, the attorneys, or the process in any way, you will lose your position as creditor and go back to representing the defendant. All the dishonors are pinned on the defendant even if you are the one who went into dishonor through your words or your actions. The defendant cannot talk or act. It all comes from you. If you bond the case and underwrite all the obligations slash law slash costs of the honorable citizens of the state of whatever, that would include the attorney, as long as he is honorable. If he is not, he refuses the indemnification and volunteers to have his dishonor give the commercial energy to the settlement, it is up to him the judge will go along with what he requests. Usually, the attorney will tell the judge that the plaintiff moves for dismissal. Number seven, performance bond. Performance bonds guarantee that parties to a contract will not be damaged by the conduct or lack of conduct of an officer. This could include an executor, trustee, officer of a court, officer of a corporation, guardian, etc. Wherever there is a fiduciary duty, there may be a need for a performance bond. An oath is a performance bond in common law. In the modern states and integrated court system, bonds are backed by insurance companies. They are actually insurance policies. Performance bond, type of contract bond which protects against loss due to the inability or refusal of a contractor to perform his contract. Such are normally required on public construction projects. Official bond, a bond given by a public officer conditioned that he shall well and faithfully perform all the duties of the office. Contractor, one who in pursuit of independent business undertakes to perform a job or piece of work, retaining in himself control of means, method, and manner of accomplishing the desired result. Construction, interpretation of statute, regulation, court decision, or other legal authority. The process or the art of determining the sense, real meaning, or proper explanation of obscure, complex, or ambiguous terms or provisions in a statute, written instrument, or oral agreement, or the application of some subject to the case in question by reasoning in the light derived from extraneous connected circumstances or laws or writings bearing upon the same or a connected matter, or by seeking and applying the probable aim and purpose of the provision drawing conclusions respecting subjects that lie beyond the direct expression of the term. Refusal, the act of one who has, by law, a right and power of having or doing something of advantage and declines it. A refusal implies the positive denial of an application or command or at least a mental determination not to comply. Power, authority to do any act which the grantor you might himself lawfully perform. The following is taken from In Search of Liberty in America, one of Byron's books. Why do officers of government hold positions called trust or profit? Look at some constitutions to find this phrase. References to the Constitution for the United States of America are provided below. Any office of honor, trust or profit under the United States, Article 1, Section 3. Any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, Article 1, Section 9. Any senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States, Article 2, Section 1. Any office or public trust under the United States, Article 6, Clause 3. Suffice it to say, trillions of dollars in assets are being held in these trusts in America today. You can verify this if you study the comprehensive annual financial reports that each corporate entity within the United States Empire is required to have. Anyone who has ever approached a government agency just to see what they do and how they do it can tell you they didn't get very far. 
Government seems to be at least as secret as any corporation, if not more so. This government secrecy goes back well before terrorism was a general concern. Our public agencies are not so public when it comes to disclosing their own conduct, their finances, their inside operations, and their productivity. Well, it turns out, just like many people and organizations that like to be secret, they do have something to hide. It's called the CAFR. The CAFR is the name for the financial accounts of any public agency. It stands for Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And it is standard to all government agencies. Your courthouses have them, school districts have them, city, county, and state governments all have CAFRs. But up until recently, hardly anyone except government insiders have even heard of the CAFR. The hard numbers are in the CAFR. This is true reporting of all accounts, flows, and holdings. When media reports anything about public finance, this is what they should be talking about. But you may have noticed they only seem to talk about this thing called the budget. The budget is something very different. For government, the budget is not so much an accounting tool as a propaganda hallucination. A budget is a projection, a goal, a target. In accounting terms, the budget is referred to as inferior to the CAFR accounts. Suppose your county has a gazillion dollars in the CAFR, but they tell you they have no budget for dog catcher. Well, that's okay. That may be exactly right. They have a bunch of money, but they have budgeted nothing for dog catcher. This community has decided that stray dogs are not a problem, so fine. That has nothing to do with any shortage of funds. It's just a budget decision. They might tell you that they don't have the money for the dog catcher, but that would be just to appease the small minority who have lost their dogs. Now say they budget a million dollars for mosquito abatement. Now they've decided to go into those CAFR accounts and set aside a million bucks. The media tells us the county budgeted a million for mosquito abatement, but they don't tell us they don't mention the gazillion dollars remaining in the CAFR accounts from which they are dispensing the million dollars. We sit here and believe that when they spend that million, there will be nothing left. They have us thinking that the budget is all there is. While we are duped into thinking government is broke, they are sitting on, in this case, nearly a gazillion dollars in many special off-budget accounts, and you don't see that unless you look at the CAFR. So now what happens if mosquito abatement goes over budget and costs two million? Well, since you and I don't know about the CAFR and that gazillion sitting in the accounts, the nightly news comes crying to us, telling us the county has gone over budget, run out of money, and they need to raise taxes or borrow to pay the extra million for the mosquito abatement. Remember, your media does not audit the CAFR. They just say whatever government says. So here's a real world example of CAFR magic. In 2007, the County of Los Angeles had an operating budget of $17.5 billion. In 2007 was the beginning of a protracted recession. Government was constantly complaining about budget shortfalls, austerity, belt tightening, robbing Peter to pay Paul and, and the necessity to raise taxes and extend the public debt. You would expect LA County's budgets over the next few years to be flat or to go down. In the five years between 2007 and 2012, LA County raised its operating budget from 17.5 billion to 25.8 billion. They're projected to spend 47% more in 2012 than 2007. In the middle of a recession, where did that money come from? Yes, they borrowed. Yes, they raised taxes, but not that much. They moved money around in the CAFR, and presto, they came up with $8 billion more per year out of thin air. From a money-skimming and laundering standpoint, the old organized crime families from the past would be green with envy at the size and scope of this operation. Compared to government, the private criminal class looks like a bunch of kids selling lemonade on the street corner. Of course, the government would arrest you if you did what they do, but, you know, they don't like the competition. So this business of borrowing and raising taxes makes no sense at all once we know about what those special funds are hiding in the CAFR. 
By not telling us about the Kaffir, they can send the tax man to come and squeeze us for the extra million for the mosquito abatement. It's a big lie. They know it's a big lie, but it has worked 10,000 times in the past. If they can pretend to be broke, and we will believe them, then why shouldn't they go ahead and rob us? If the trust transfers possession of trust assets to another, the trustee can make rules and regulations for the use of the trust property and also rules for the conduct of those persons accepting protection or receiving trust property. Trust property may remain in the so-called public form held directly by the trust or its officers or corporations, or it may be conveyed into the private domain. It is all effectively trust property, public and private, until it is taken out of the protection of trust. Rules of the Game Rule number one, the fiction and real cannot mix. The public and the private cannot mix. You cannot create a public debt. That is against the law. A creditor can issue a bond, evidence of a public debt, and use the bond to discharge other public debts. You cannot use the public Federal Reserve routing numbers on the private credit instruments you issue. Those routing numbers are public. You cannot use the pre-printed public bank checks to represent your private credit. Those checks are public. Your credit instruments use your private routing number, EIN, with the closed account number. You are a private banker. The closed account number was accepted and put on a UCC1. Your acceptance of the account number takes it to the private side for adjustment and set off. You gave notice to the Secretary of Treasury or his predecessor that you had accepted the account as collateral. Your secured party collateral rights are private. You are a secured party on the private side even without filing a UCC-1. The UCC-1 is to give notice on the public side of your collateral rights. That is why you can use the account for adjustment and set off of public debts. There is no money on the private side. Debt is used on the public side to discharge other public debts. There is no money on the public side either, but debt is accepted as money. The debts that are owed to you by the public can be used to discharge public debts. A debt is a liability to the debtor and an asset to the creditor. You are the creditor, so you are using your asset, a bond, each time you use your credit. You can bond your bill of exchange or use a bond. Either way, it is a bond, evidence of a public debt owed to you that discharges the public debt. If the state cannot file a claim against you because it is a fictitious entity and you are a real man, then it must file a claim against a straw man to get to you. What is it trying to get? Does it want your body in jail, the money in your bank account, your house, your business? The answer is no, it wants your credit. It already has the rest of it because everything is either registered or found on registered property. The state does not want the things that are held in the name of the straw man, but it has no compunction against taking those things if you dishonor it in any way. All those things, except your body, belong to the straw man, which is an officer, agent, or employee of the U.S. or one of its states. They do not belong to you. The money, Federal Reserve notes, belong to the Federal Reserve because it is the entity that created it. The straw man just gets to use it as long as it follows the Federal Reserve rules. The title to real property associated with your house is held by the straw man. The business license for your business was issued to the straw man. The registration for the car names the straw man as the owner. The driver's license was issued to the straw man. None of those assets belong to you. They are all pieces of paper that belong to the straw man, unless it fails to follow the rules. The presentment has a complainant, a moving party. What is it trying to move? What is its complaint? It is usually using a statute as the grounds for the complaint. If public and private can't mix, the complaint must be against the public straw man, not you. Why would the state care if a piece of paper violated a public, fictitious law? What is the motivation? The state is trying to move you to let it use your credit. If you refuse, the state can move the court to grant relief from your dishonor. Does the state really have a complaint? Or is it just asking for your help? 
Maybe his complaint is that it is out of money. There is no money. None on the private side, gold and silver, and none on the public side except your credit. What does the office manager do when it needs more money for paper clips? It requisitions the guys on the top floor for money to buy more paper clips. Do the bosses say, no way, of course not? That would be counterproductive to the purpose of the business. Think of the state as your business. You need to be sure there are enough paper clips or the business may fail. Why would you refuse to honor the requisition? Why would you argue about whether or not the requisition form was filled out properly? Why would you deny that you are the proper party to fulfill the requisition? Why would you ignore the requisition? Why would you get mad and start charging the messenger with fraud? If you ignore the requisitions and spend all of your business money trying not to fulfill the requisitions, the business will fail. Where would that leave you? Your business is down the tubes, you might be in jail for breach of contract, your property has been taken to pay the corporate attorneys, your money is gone, all the people who depended on your business have to find other sources of your products and services, you are a very irresponsible businessman. If you had just honored the requisition, you would still be on the top floor. Instead, the trust assets are gone and you are making license plates. The state has no substance. It has no money. It has no inherent right to anything except what it has created, like the straw man. It has a very important function. It has been charged with providing for the means by which you can go into the grocery stores, gas stations, libraries, shopping malls, airports, car dealerships, and Walmarts. If it does not get money from somewhere, it cannot continue to provide the infrastructure you find so convenient. The only source it has is taxes. License, permit, and registration fees are a source of income for the state, but that is not sufficient for the giant octopus feeding machine we have grown to love and depend on. It needs to feed off of your credit, and if you don't voluntarily let the state use it, the state will use your dishonor to take it. If you filed a claim against the straw man, the state doesn't even control that anymore. If you have named the Secretary of State as the secured party, it has additional expenses as trustee of the party held in the name of that straw man. The situation is getting worse for the state. Where will it get the money it needs to continue supplying all the services you expect from it? It has to go to you and ask you for your credit. Have you ever had to ask your dad for financial help after you left his house and were out on your own? It is embarrassing. The state does not just want to ask if it can use your credit. It will have to find creative ways to ask for it, get it, and save face in the process. The trick is for the state to ask for your help without the unenlightened person slash U.S. citizen being able to see it. The state must have your credit and it is going to get it one way or the other. It is going to get it the easy way or the hard way. It's all up to you. So, the only thing the state can't take is your body and other substance in your possession unless you voluntarily authorize the state to use it. You always have a choice to retain possession of your substance or let the state take possession of it. Remember, possession is nine-tenths of the law. What is the other one-tenth then? Honor. Rule number two. Stay in honor at all cost. Your mission, Jim, should you decide to accept it. Your mission, should you choose 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 to accept it. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to honor the state when it asks you, in its aggressive way, to let it use your credit, the exemption. The state is raising you up as a creditor every time it gives you a presentment. It is your choice. You can honor the state by accepting its presentment and issuing an authorization voluntarily for it to get enough of your credits to equal the value of its presentment dollar for dollar, or you can voluntarily dishonor the state by refusing, arguing, making it prove its claim, or defending the straw man, pretending the state has no right to make its claim. Wow, that is a hard choice. You can voluntarily authorize the state's use of your exemption or you can voluntarily dishonor the state, at which time it will use your dishonor to take property from the straw man or take your body and collect rent while you sit in jail. Gee, 
What should I do? What should I do? Pay attention, sonny. Pay attention. Nice boy, but he doesn't listen to a word you say. Hey, I say pay attention, boy. But look at me when I'm talking to you. This boy doesn't pay attention. There is an easy way and a hard way. The choice is always yours. The state is only following your lead. If you argue or defend, it gets to use your exemption and maybe take some of your possessions besides. If you accept and authorize the state to use your exemption, it is required to accept it. What do you have to lose? Is your exemption limited? Can it be depleted? No. What difference does it make if the state gets your exemption? The difference is the grocery stores and Walmart stay open, the fire department responds to fire calls, the garbage trucks pick up your garbage, and the streets are repaired. If you understand how to stay in honor, it's a win-win situation. If you do not know how to stay in honor, it might be a win-lose situation with you losing. The state will get what it wants either way. Rule number three, there is no money. What do you use to pay your bills? If there is no money, what does the state use to pay its bills? Do you really have any bills? Whose name is on the contract with the electric company, the mortgage, the credit card, or the student loan? It isn't your name, it's the straw man's name. The Constitution says, no state shall make anything but gold or silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Well, there it is, a prohibition against the states. Does it say the United States or its agents can't use something other than gold or silver for payment of debts? No. Since there is no gold or silver coin in circulation in the United States and all the businesses you have grown to love are in the United States, it is a good thing the United States has created a straw man for you to control and a Federal Reserve notes for it to use like you would use money if you had some. The straw man is able to pay all its bills with Federal Reserve notes. You can't, but the straw man can. Isn't it great that you control a straw man slash person? The trouble is, the straw man can't get a real title to anything it buys with Federal Reserve notes. You can get possession of the substance, but you only get to retain possession as long as you stay in honor. The straw man stays in equity honor and you fulfill your fiduciary duties as a presumed trustee. If you choose to go into dishonor, you voluntarily give up possession of whatever property the state wants to take to get the credits it needs to keep its business ventures going. Nothing personal, just business. But everything you said and done, uh, when, when everything's said and done in, in court, and you've you know, discharged all your debts, you've paid your debt to society. So ultimately, which is it? Are we talking business here? Or are we talking justice? And as Jordan would say, it's nothing personal, it's just business. Rule number four, do not participate in public plays. When the state invites a straw man to participate in one of its revenue events, you have options. The presumption is you will volunteer to represent the accused straw man. You're pretty sure you will do that because you've always done it before. Think of the event as a play. The play has actors with scripts. Each actor knows the plot, his lines, and the outcome. Their play has been practiced over and over in every county and every state. The outcome is almost always the same. A man, not one of the scheduled actors, crashes into their play and carries out the plot. Without the man, the whole plot changes. The outcome changes. They need the man to get the same ending as they've always had before. When the man does not participate in the play, there's confusion and chaos. The planned script does not work without the man. The usual scenario includes the man volunteering to represent the accused straw man as a trustee. Each time a straw man is charged, a new trust is created. It is even possible that each time the straw man's name is spelled in a slightly different way in the complaining presentment, a different trust is created. There might be two or four different trusts referenced in the same presentment. Each trust is going to produce income for the plaintiff, if the script is followed as planned. It all has to do with trust. Everywhere you look, there are trusts. The straw man is a trust when it is named on a complaint, indictment, or traffic ticket. Sometimes it is a Sestral K trust when it is the beneficiary of another trust. Sometimes it is a trustor of another trust. Sometimes it is a corporation sold. Sometimes it is a defendant. Sometimes it is a plaintiff. 
Sometimes it is a debtor. Sometimes it is a creditor. Sometimes it is a secured party. It is a very versatile vehicle or tool. There are always at least three parties to a trust. No one owns a trust on the private side. But on the public side, there's always a responsible party who is deemed to be the owner to the trust. This is a fallacy that is often used by the state in relation to trusts that have real property as the trust corpus. They always want to know who the owner of the trust is. A trust is just an agreement among three or more parties. The trustee holds the legal title to the trust corpus and is the one deemed to be the owner of the public trust. It is useless to argue with public persons about the status of a private trust, common law trust, pure trust, etc. If the trust holds public property or is involved with Federal Reserve notes, it qualifies as a public trust. The beneficiary holds the equitable title to the trust corpus. The title is bifurcated. Trust, a legal entity created by a grantor for the benefit of designated beneficiaries under the laws of the state and the valid trust instrument. Indenture, the document which contains the terms and conditions which govern the conduct of the trustee and the rights of the beneficiaries. Exchanger, exchange, to part with, give or transfer for an equivalent. Trustor, one who creates a trust, also called settler. Settler, the grantor or donor in a deed of settlement, also one who creates a trust. Trust corpus, trust property. The property which is the subject matter of the trust, the trust raised. Creator, one who creates. Trustee, person holding property in trust, one who holds legal title to property in trust for the benefit of another person, beneficiary, who must carry out specific duties with regard to the property. Legal title, one which is complete and perfect so far as regards the apparent right of ownership and possession, but which carries no beneficial interest in the property, another person being equitably entitled thereto. Beneficiary, one who benefits from act of another. Equitable title, a right in the party to whom it belongs to have the legal title transferred to him or the beneficial interest of one person whom equity regards as the real owner. Surety, a person who is primarily liable for payment of debt or performance of obligation of another. Creditor, one to whom money is due and in the ordinary acceptation as reference to financial or business transactions. For the original straw man trust, mom was the exchange or trust or settler. Your mother applied to the state of whatever for the creation of a trust. She chose the date of birth for it. She chose its name. She requested evidence that it had been created, a birth certificate. She was the informant. She delivered the paper description of the original property to the trust creator. It was a description of the real substance. The paper description was the original trust corpus. More trust property can be added later. The state of whatever was the creator of the original trust. The state complied with mom's request and created a straw man with the name and date of birth your mother requested. She applied for a social security number for it. She put it into commerce by getting it medical records, a daycare center matriculation number, a public school matriculation number, a little league ID number, a library card number, etc., etc., etc. Sometimes the creator is also the original exchanger, trustor, or settler. Who is the beneficiary of the original trust? The beneficiary changes each time a new trust is created. You are the original beneficiary, though, if you choose to use your beneficial interest. If you choose not to use it, the citizens of the state that created it are the beneficiaries. This is part of the highest and best use principle. If the property is not being put to its highest and best use, it can be borrowed for a time and put to better use. You have not been using it. You have not found any claims against it, so why should it just sit there not being used? That first trust was created for your benefit, if you choose to use it. Remember, the reason the first party, creator, creates a trust is for the second party, trustee, to manage the trust corpus for the benefit of a third party, beneficiary. What is the trust corpus? 
The state complied with mom's request and created a straw man with the name and date of birth she requested. Mom is the one who put your physical description on the application for the certificate slash evidence that the trust had been created. She delivered the description, seven pounds, 11 ounces, 19 inches long in a footprint. All of this was on paper. The paper is the trust corpus. That was the consideration that was exchanged in the original trust. Exchange for what? The ability to gain possession, not title, of houses, cars, shoes, books, etc. without paying for them. She applied for a social security number for it. She put it into commerce by getting it medical records, a daycare center matriculation number, a public school matriculation number, a little league ID number, a library card, etc., etc., etc. All of these paper contracts between the trust and agencies of municipal corporations are trust assets. These are all part of the trust corpus, the trust property. They are all property that can be used as evidence of contractual obligations the trust has or as collateral for debts the trust owes. It appears the trust is using your description and your credit to gain assets. It has an obligation to you. Maybe these assets can be considered benefits for which you owe an obligation because of your close relationship with the trust. Or these assets can be considered collateral for the debt the trust owes you. Who is the trustee? On the private side, if an appointed trustee resigns or dies, the trust corpus reverts to the beneficiaries or back to the trustor. It is useless to create a trust without appointing a trustee. The trust created by the state upon mom's request must also have a trustee. The problem is, depending on how it's going to be used, the creation of the trust is a matter of construction and operation of law. This is a constructive trust. Constructive trust trust created by operation of law against one who by actual or constructive fraud, by duress or by abuse of confidence or by commission of wrong or by any form of unconscionable conduct or other questionable means has obtained or holds a legal right to property which he should not in equity and good conscience hold and enjoy. Construction. Drawing conclusions respecting subjects that lie beyond the direct expression of the term operation of law. This term expresses the manner in which rights, and sometimes liabilities, devolve upon a person by the mere application to the particular transaction of the established rules of law, without the act or cooperation of the party himself. Default, an omission of that which ought to be done, specifically the omission or failure to perform a legal or contractual duty. There can be more than one trustee for a trust. One trustee may have the duty of performing certain functions for the trust. Another trustee may perform different functions. The identity of the trustee or trustees of these individual trusts is often not expressed, as there is no requirement for there to even be a written trust indenture. On the public side, there must always be a default trustee. If no one volunteers to fulfill the duties of the trustee, when a corporation or limited liability company is created, the statutory default managing officer is the Secretary of State of the state where the entity is being created. In some cases, the Secretary of State would be the logical default trustee. In other cases, the lack of a trustee may result in a presumption that you are the trustee. Trustees have a fiduciary duty to manage the trust honorably and for the benefit of the beneficiary. A trustee cannot use the trust for personal gain. A trustee that is acting outside his duty or not performing at all is in breach of his fiduciary duty. That is not tolerated on the private side or the public side. Trustees in breach of their fiduciary duty are held personally responsible for the breach and take on the financial penalties for their actions, malfeasance or lack of action, nonfeasance. Here is an example of a typical court scenario when the man participates. An investigator from ABC agency of a municipal corporation has filed an information with a prosecuting attorney. On the public side, affidavits are not required. The informant is not required to sign an affidavit and submit it to the attorney to commence a public action against the individual being investigated. Affidavits were required in equity when someone wanted to file a claim in court. In admiralty in the public box, affidavits are no longer required. They have been replaced with what is called an information. 
an affidavit is signed under oath. The statements made in an affidavit are the signer's bond. His word is his bond. The affidavit formally bonded the case. Now that there are no affidavits, there are no bonds to bond the cases. The prosecuting attorney has decided whether or not to commence an action. The informant may have already completed an administrative process. In the case of the IRS, a 90-day letter, 30-day letter, or a 10-day letter for the attorney to use as a basis for bringing the action. It may not have even started an administrative process. Nine times out of 10, the administrative process is not needed because they are almost sure you will agree without knowing it to represent the accused individual, the trust, by volunteering to act as its trustee. The attorney is going to create a new trust to be accused on the complaint or indictment. If you go into contempt for defending and not taking responsibility for the new trust, you will either pay with the trust corpus or you will go to jail and your credit exemption will be tapped during the time they are housing and feeding you and giving you medical treatment. The trust corpus might include the balance in a bank account, a title to real property or a car or any other public asset. Creator. The attorney is the creator of the accused trust. It might be in all caps John Henry Doe. Notice that they never put your name on a complaint, indictment, or traffic ticket. Even if it is written in uppercase and lowercase letters, it is still a fiction and a trust. Remember, we cannot mix public and private. Trust name. The name of the trust is all caps John Henry Doe. In the body of the complaint, a reference may be made to all caps John H. Doe or John Doe all caps or John Doe in upper and lower case. This is how the judgment can be multiplied. These might all be new trust against which the final judgment can be applied and for which it is presumed you will volunteer to be the trustee and for which you will be presumed to be the surety. The trust is expected to be the defendant. The question is, who is the trustee and who is taking responsibility for the trust activities? Trustor. The attorney is also the trustor. He is putting the trust corpus into the trust. That is the charge. It is a debt liability on the public side and a credit asset on the private side. We have always presumed the charge is a bad thing. It is only bad if the man is found in contempt of the process or of the attorney or of the judge or of a number of other possibilities. It is very easy to go into contempt. If you don't agree to take responsibility, you will be in contempt of your presumed fiduciary duty. Creditors do not go into contempt. Beneficiary. The beneficiary is the state of whatever, which is also the plaintiff in the case. It is the person that stands to gain from the charges, trust corpus, but it only has the equitable interest in the trust corpus. It does not have the liability of being the trustee. The beneficiary has an attorney bring the complaint. That way, the beneficiary is not held responsible for bringing a claim without a bond, evidence of a debt. The attorney does it instead. The beneficiary has to hold on to its creditor position and can't if it brings unfounded claims. The plaintiff seldom signs the complaint. The attorney's signature is usually the only one on it. Trustee. This is the trust position that carries all the liability. The trustee has a fiduciary duty to manage this trust property for the benefit of the state of whatever. If it does not, the trustee accepts the responsibility for the losses suffered by the beneficiary, the state. There is no appointed trustee. There is a presumption that there will be a trustee when it is needed. The attorney has the complaint served on the original trust with a name like the accused individual, the defendant trust. Someone has to represent the defendant. At this point, the only representative for the trust is the creator, the prosecuting attorney, which has made a commitment to the beneficiary. Once the charge is signed by the attorney and delivered to someone who might volunteer to be the trustee, the attorney does not even have the option of withdrawing the charge without the defendant's agreement, rules of court. Since the complaint was delivered into your hands as the presumed trustee and surety, you have to agree to the withdrawal of the charges before they can be withdrawn. As soon as you hire a good attorney or decide to defend the trust yourself, the liability is moved from the prosecuting attorney to you. The fact that you are defending all by itself is a dishonor. Anything other than all-out acceptance is a dishonor. 
Your dishonor is what gives the prosecuting attorney the energy to bond the case. All cases have to be bonded. Whoever bonds the case is the creditor. Whoever is in dishonor is the debtor. They need you to dishonor the process, the attorneys or the judge to have the standard script result in the standard outcome. If you fail to immediately go into dishonor, there will be plenty of opportunities in the script for you to carry out the plot to get you into dishonor. You can plead not guilty, testify, defend, call witnesses, question witnesses, file motions, file a countersuit, answer questions, or not respond at all. Just to name a few ways to volunteer to be the trustee and to be in dishonor. Your voluntary dishonor will authorize the use of your credit to bond the case. Since you did not voluntarily bond the case, you are in dishonor. Surety. Since the standard script will be used for the court event, it is likely the man who has volunteered to be the trustee for the accused trust will defend the trust. That will guarantee the standard outcome. The defendant will be found guilty and the trust corpus will be liquidated enough to pay the judgment debt. If the event involves criminal charges, the man's body will be jailed so the state can revenue the man's credit from the private into the public state. That is what keeps the public machine running. Revenue. The man will be the surety for the judgment debtor once the trust is found guilty. Plaintiff. The state beneficiary is the plaintiff and presumed creditor. As long as the man plays by the standard script. Defendant. The prosecuting attorney needs to have a volunteer to defend the trust or he will be stuck representing the accused trust himself. He is the defendant, but does not plan on holding that position very long. With the help of the judge and the defense attorney, the prosecuting attorney will be able to pass the liability on to the trust and its representative and surety, you. But you have to go into dishonor for this to happen. All charges, arguments, and testimony is dangerous in the public court. Remember, it is not your court. They can only see fiction. So if you're testifying, you are recognized only as the representative of the fiction. The I'm not that person challenge is an argument. The judge already knows you are not a piece of paper. But if you are talking to him, he presumes you are the trustee for the trust paper. In that capacity, he can talk to you. He is expecting you to breach your fiduciary duties by going into dishonor. Then they win, you lose. You want a win-win situation. Be careful even with the copyright. If you can bring the copyright into the case without testifying through third-party witnesses, you may be able to stave off a demand for trust property. If you have already given the right to use the now copyrighted name to a corporation, you cannot revoke that authorization after the fact. You may have done this by applying for a loan. You gave them the use of the name on the application. You gave them the use of the name on a driver's license application. You are the one who tells them what name to put on the license. You can't come back later and charge them for using the name you previously gave them. If there is no driver's license application, you may be able to give notice of the copyright to the officer and then enforce the copyright violation because he had notice of your restrictions to the use of that name. Even if the car is registered with the state, you may be able to use the copyright in this situation. If you know how and do not dishonor your own claim to being the private owner of the name, here is a different scenario when the man does not participate. An investigator from ABC Agency of a Municipal Corporation has filed an information with a prosecuting attorney. Before things get this far, you should have completed your administrative procedure on the activity that is the subject matter of the court case. See the section on administrative process. The prosecuting attorney has decided to commence an action. The attorney creates a new trust to be the accused on the complaint or indictment, which is delivered into your hands. This time, you accepted the presentment for value, returned it, and authorized the use of your credit and bonded the case. You give notice to the public of these private actions you have taken. Use third parties to testify to the agreement of the parties of the dishonor of the plaintiff if necessary. You do not get involved in the issues of the case other than the agreement of the parties. You can bond the case. You do not have to be the trustee and represent the accused trust to take responsibility for its presumed violations of the state statutes. You are one of the people. You are a creditor with priority over fictions. You are the one, the one who has the power to create 
a win-win situation for all parties. In this situation, creator, the prosecuting attorney is still the creator. Trust name, the name on the trust is still the all caps John Henry Doe. Trust or, the prosecuting attorney is still putting the charge into the trust as the corpus. Beneficiary, the beneficiary is still the state of whatever. Trustee, since you have not volunteered to be the trustee, the prosecuting attorney is still the responsible party. You are the one who accepted delivery of the complaint that was sent to the trust over which you are presumed to be the trustee. If you can stay in honor while you take on the obligations of the trust by using your exemption and your credit as surety for the trust, you will be fine. You can argue with the attorney and judge and the witnesses and the clerk showing how bad a trustee you are, or you can accept the state's request for revenue and authorize the use of your exemption credit. It is your choice. Surety. The surety ship on this case can be shared. Surety ship is a voluntary act. You can volunteer to be the surety using your exemption credit. Someone else can volunteer to dishonor someone or to dishonor the process, thereby becoming the surety. Free will is always a factor here. The big question is, who will be the surety? Since there seldom is a bond in the case until after the trial is over, you can present your bond to bond the case. Plaintiff. Whoever bonds the case is the plaintiff. Charges cannot be brought unless there is a bond. If the man supplies the bond, the man is the creditor. The tables can turn. You can do a counterclaim by removing the case into another court for judicial review of your administrative process and get an estoppel on their case. Defendant. The prosecuting attorney is the defendant, unless there is a defense attorney who has put a notice of appearance into the case. If so, then the defense attorney is the defendant. As the creditor, you can authorize the prosecuting attorney or defense attorney, if he has filed a notice of appearance, to write the check to settle the account. The check is backed by your bond. Administrative process. Here is a hypothetical situation. A few months ago, ABC Agency sent the all caps John H. Doe Trust an administrative presentment with a charge, energy, of $5,000. It wants or needs $5,000. You are the source, the banker. If you don't give it to them, they will use your dishonor to support a claim to $5,000 worth of trust property. You accepted it for assessed value, $5,000, returned it, gave them an authorization to use your credit, exchange your exemption for the discharge of the charge. Your acceptance is the return of the energy. They received your authorization, which may have been a bill of exchange, bond for discharge, or other instrument you chose to use. Now ABC Agency has hired an attorney to bring charges in the public court against the all caps John H. Doe. A summons and complaint were delivered into your hands today. What do you do? Step one, visualize this first. You are in the courtroom on your case. John H. Doe may have removed ABC's case to a different court by filing an amended complaint requesting judicial review of your administrative process. The purpose of this case is to get a public order that will overcome the claims being made in ABC Agency's case against the all caps John H. Doe. You have to introduce evidence into the judge's file to give him facts upon which he can base his decision. If you are asking for findings to facts, he must have some facts in the evidence file. You don't want the respondent to enter evidence and have his be the only evidence upon which the judge will base his decision. If you want conclusions of law, he must have some law in the evidence file. The only way facts and law get in the evidence file, the one the judge keeps in his possession, not the clerk's file, you have to introduce it in open court. This is done by handing your paper with an original signature and seal of a public witness, clerk of court, county recorder, county assessor, notary public, or other public officer, to the bailiff or judge's clerk who will then hand it to the judge. Have a copy for the attorney also. You do not do this if there is a public defender. You have to introduce some law that supports your request into the record to give him something upon which to make conclusions of law. Putting this into the complaint as an exhibit and filing it with the clerk and giving notice of it to the respondent does not get it into the judge's file. More on this part on the administrative process later in the public section. You need evidence and facts and law. What do you want the judge to do? 
This is the time before you even start your administrative process to decide what you want and what evidence you will need to support what? Facts. You want the judge in ABC's case or the judge in your removed case to review the administrative process and issue an order confirming the facts contained in the notary certificate of dishonor or certificate of breach or certificate of non-response, whichever is appropriate for the situation. Even though you do not quote statutes, the notary certificate is recognized as prima facie evidence of the facts contained therein. Look at the commercial statutes from your state. The UCC source is 1-202. Since your administrative process will result in a certificate, this is the time to decide what you want in the certificate. So you write it first. Then you write your notice of acceptance and request for whatever you want from the person who sent the presentment to the straw man. Put the horse in front of the car, or you may find that your notice did not contain the exact wording you want to use in the certificate. It cannot be changed after the fact because the notary could be accused of making legal determinations or practicing law. Do not put your notaries in jeopardy. Step two, prepare the certificate of non-response. This is the notary certificate. It is not yours. The notary will issue it to you. You will then be the holder of the certificate. It is like a bond in that it is evidence of the debt owed to you by the respondent who dishonored you by not responding or not complying with the duty. This certificate is number three because it will be issued after the respondent has had two opportunities to honor you by complying with your request or performing a duty that is required of his office. His communication is not a response to your notice of acceptance and request or to the notary's notice of non-response if it addresses some other issue. If his response is an argument or testimony, he is in dishonor. What do you want the certificate to say? If you used a bill of exchange, you want the name of the notary, name of presenter, the name of acceptor, description of presentment, name of accused, state commercial statute regarding notary certificate, certification statement, notice that presentment was accepted and returned with attachments with a request to the presenter at his company at its address by certified mail with return receipt of service, notice of non-response with a second request to the presenter at his company at its address by certified mail with return receipt and certificate of service, presenter refused the request, the presenter did not send notice of dishonor, the presenter did not cure his dishonor, the presenter agreed, one, he dishonored the acceptor, two, the acceptor accepted the presentment, three, the acceptor returned the presentment, four, the acceptor exchanged his exemption for a discharge, Five, the acceptor presented authorization to use his exemption for court charges. Six, the acceptor sent processing instructions with the authorization. Seven, the acceptor sent a statement of account showing a zero balance. Eight, the acceptor sent a letter of credit to the Secretary of Treasury. Nine, his refusal to send the confirmation or notice of dishonor did not negate settlement. 10. He and his agency have no capacity to pursue collection. Further collection makes him and his agency liable for $5,000 to the straw man, and the straw man can secure its $5,000 claim. You date it. The notary signature is on it the notary seal, notary stamp, notary address, and the administrative process number. Step three, prepare your notice of acceptance. This is your acceptance notice, cover letter to your acceptance of the presentment. You sign it. The notary mails it and gives you a certificate of service with her stamp and seal. See sample two, see sample three, standard certificate of service. What do you want it to say?
certified mail number, the name of the notary, the name of presenter, principal agent notice, date, reference note, type of notice, and then the facts. The acceptor has accepted the presentment. The acceptor is returning the presentment. The acceptor is exchanging his exemption for a discharge. The acceptor is presenting authorization to use his exemption for court charges. The acceptor is sending processing instructions with the authorization. The acceptor is sending a statement of account showing a zero balance. The acceptor is sending a letter of credit to the Secretary of Treasury. The presenter's refusal to send the confirmation or notice of dishonor will not negate settlement. The presenter and his agency will have no capacity to pursue collection. Further collection makes the presenter and his agency liable for $5,000 to the straw man. Straw man can secure its $5,000 claim. Signature of acceptor and the administrative process number. Step four, prepare the notice of non-response for the notary. See sample four. This is the notary's notice. The notary is your third party public witness. What do you want it to say? Certified mail number, name of notary, name of presenter, principal agent notice, date, reference note, and the facts. Notary sent notice and request by certified mail, return receipt requested, and certificate of service. Presentment was dishonored. The notary is attaching a copy of first presentment to this notice of non-response. Notary is making a second request for same thing. Performance or statement is expected in 10 days. A caveat, fair to cure breach will be agreement of parties to statements in first notice. Notary signature, the notary seal, and the notary stamp, and your administrative process number. This completes the administrative process. You now have the certificate establishing A, that you accepted a return and exchanged your exemption for a discharge, B, that your acceptance was received and accepted by the respondent twice, C, that the respondent refused to respond or comply with your request, D, that there is an agreement of the parties, E, that the respondent has no commercial energy to pursue collection, F, that you have all the commercial energy regarding the subject account, G, that you are in honor, H, that the respondent is in dishonor. The court presentment. The state or city or county or an agency has just honored you with a court presentment. It is a verified complaint or grand jury indictment or traffic ticket. Do you feel honored? No. Why not? Do you feel fear? Anger? Confidence you can defend your position. Let's analyze this situation. State is used in this writing generically as a general term representing any corporate quasi-government organization and its agencies. You is used in this writing to represent the reader, the living soul. Straw man is used in this writing to represent an individual U.S. citizen, but not a state as defined above. What is this presentment? What are its components? It has your name on it. Stop. It does not have your name on it. It has a straw man's name on it. The moving party is named a straw man as a violator of a statute and has asked you to take responsibility for the violation. The state, city, county, or IRS cannot file a claim against you. It is charging the straw man with a violation. Stop. It is establishing a value through an index associated with statute violations. This is ingenious. If you honor the presenter with an acceptance and return, the index establishes the amount of credit you will provide to the state. If you dishonor, the index establishes the amount of property the state will take to get the credits it needs. The presumption is that you are in partnership with the straw man. 
In some cases, the index establishes how many months the state will hold your body for breach of fiduciary duty while it collects your credits. It suggests a time period for you to answer. Stop. Don't trust this one. It establishes a time period for the straw man to answer on the public side, usually 20 days. If you don't accept in 72 hours from the private side, you will be in dishonor. The presentment is designed to help you into a dishonor. You don't have to go that way if you don't want to. It has the name of the party bringing the claim. Someone has to approach you and ask for your help. That person is taking a big chance. By signing his name, he could end up owing the amount the state is asking you to provide. This is usually an attorney. He signs his name to it and becomes the attorney of record for the plaintiff. The state, through an attorney or other officer, has given you a court presentment, a request for your help. Options. You have options. You can defend it, argue about it, conditionally accept it, ignore it, or accept it. You already know the right choice. You only have one good choice, except if you defend, you are refusing to take responsibility for managing the affairs of your business, the United States. Whether you want to admit it or not, the United States is your creation. It continues in business because you authorize it. If you argue, you are in a controversy with your own business managers. If you conditionally accept, you're requiring the United States to prove it has a claim when it is in receivership and cannot have a valid claim against you without your permission. If you ignore the presentment, you're acting like an irresponsible creditor and will lose your status as creditor. Your only choice is to accept. That by itself is not enough though. If you accept it and return it, you have not carried out the promise you made when you accepted it. It is like signing the requisition form but not instructing anyone who can write a check. You have accepted the request, but you have not given them what they need, your credit. It is like promising to pay the electric bill but never getting around to it. If you do this, they will turn off the electricity. When you accept the presentment for a value, you have to follow through with some type of instrument. If you do not authorize the state to use your credit to settle the account after you have accepted, you are in dishonor. If you do not authorize the attorney to use your credit to settle the court account after you've accepted, you are in dishonor. The state and the attorney will use your dishonor to charge your agents with authority to take the straw man's property, sheriff and or the body bailiff. Either way, the state and the court will get the use of your credit. The United States and its states are in receivership, so they have no credit of their own. They need your credit and they will get it. The corporate counties and cities are in the same dysfunctional situation. They all need your credit. When they ask for it, give it to them. Follow through with your promise of acceptance and give them the use of your credit to cover bond all the charges. Be the creditor you can be. Take responsibility.